and you've got so much to celebrate and, and be proud of. And I'm absolutely full of admiration by the way you've managed your busy work lives, home lives, as well as the programme and the QI project and being the group that have, have transitioned into doing all this virtually as well. So you absolutely have my admiration. And I'm so looking forward to hearing about some of the quality improvement work that you've been un undertaking. And I've had just a sneaky peek at, at, at some of the work that you've been doing. And, and, and to me, that's real evidence that, that the programme not only is, is helping your development as, as individuals, but actually is having so much wider an impact because it's supporting the teams that you work in. But really importantly, it's, it's having an impact on the people that you provide care for. And, and as Gemma says, this is just the beginning and, 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 and you're, you're tied to the foundation now, now for life and, and you have absolutely amazing ability and talent. And, and that was always there, and, but I hope what, that, what the programme has done has enabled you to recognise some of your great abilities and that it's giving you the tools and confidence to progress now in your career. And I'm sure over the time you've built a really positive support network amongst each other. And, and I think those networks are just so important to have those peer connections, you know, because, you know, there is no doubt as nurses and midwives, there are some really tough days. There are days where you need a colleague that that will encourage and support you. And, and, I, and I hope that you can you can do that. So. I think my message to you is to be really proud of what you've achieved so far. And this is just the beginning. I'm certainly proud of all of you. And HEE is absolutely thrilled to be able to support this development in, in a group of our future leaders. Also, I must say a huge thanks to Gemma and the team for having the courage to, to, to carry on these programmes through really difficult times and, and to take this virtually. So we were able to have continuity. And it's lovely now, as, as Gemma says, there, there is now quite a, a large group of people that have been through the Windrush programme. So the alumni is there and infiltrating all, all parts of, of, of the healthcare network, which is just fabulous. But at your, your, your contact with HEE doesn't end today as you finish. I will put my email address in, in the chat. I, I think you've all got it anyway. But if I can ever be of any help or support to any of you, please don't be afraid to contact me. I, I love to hear from you. So I'm really looking forward to, to the rest of this morning and your presentations and well done, everybody. Thank you so much, Liz. And we'll do, we'll do a muted round of applause there. That's fantastic. Thank you. And thank you for setting us off on such a, a wonderful foot in. We also have with us today, Joan Myers, who at the moment is sat in the background and she's going to be presenting for us a little bit later on about 12 o'clock. Um, I just want to check, Joan, are you there at the moment? Yes, I'm here, yes. Uh, so, so just as an introduction, so you know who we're amongst, who's in your audience. So Joan has as you possibly already know, a, a huge and um, prestigious reputation as a result of her leadership in children's nursing across the world. That's been through her roles within the NHS and also her charity work. And she's been recognised and accoladed for the impact of her work uh, throughout the, her whole career. We're so lucky to have Joan as one of our trustees of the foundation. And the reason why I say that is because Joan has been promoting the agenda around equality of opportunity for nurses from ethnic minorities for many, many years, really before it was on the agenda. So it's so, um, so pivotal, really, that we have Joan here today to, to share with you her thoughts and insights. Now, you're in for a treat later on when it comes to Joan's, uh, Joan's talk to you, and she's, a, she's an absolutely inspirational speaker. But Joan, did you have any uh, initial welcome uh, words for the group this morning? Um, hi, everyone. Just to say welcome to you all. Um, you've all, all are absolutely tremendous. You've done really well to actually 
um, adapt to the changing world that we're living in and doing your projects and stuff. And I'm really looking forward to seeing all your quality improvement projects because there's some really excellent stuff there. Really good and fantastic to the foundation for facilitating it all. And to be on the same platform with Liz Fenton, we seem to be like a double act. We're everywhere together, aren't we, Liz? It's fantastic. So thank you so much, Gemma, and really looking forward to hearing what everybody's going to be sharing this afternoon. And I've got a nice little presentation for you later. Yeah. Fantastic. We've got that to look forward to. Thank you so much. We will at some point be joined by Greta as well, our CEO of the foundation. I'll look out for when she arrives. She's en route to London at the moment. And when she does, we'll, uh, we'll pause and she can say hello to you all. OK, without further ado, let's get going with our presentation. So you all, as you know, have undertaken a quality improvement project and you presented a poster to the foundation, which was judged by one of our QI experts, Claire Henry, and also one of our nursing leadership team, Joe Matheson. Uh, they were independently scored and the top five have been selected. Now, it's always a really difficult decision as to which five to select because there are so many that are worthy of this position. So the ones that have been selected just represent the impact of the quality improvement project in terms of a measurable change and also the breadth and scope of the work. So we've aimed to get a good variety there for us to listen to. Um, but every single one of you that submitted your projects, thank you so much. And, and, and also think about where that might take you next. And um, we're very committed at the foundation to supporting you to write these projects up for publication and thinking about how you disseminate your work. So um, as we listen to the presentations today, hopefully you'll be inspired to, um, to think about where your projects will go next. So we'll hear from each of our five presenters. There'll be opportunities for questions. If you want to put your questions into the chat box and then I can invite you to ask your questions. Liz and Joan will also, I'm sure, have some comments and questions as we go along. So I'm going to ask the team to uh, start our slideshow now. We've got some slides. And Janita, if you could get yourselves ready to present, you'll be first up for it. Brilliant, Janita. And, and if you could let, uh, is it Jackie? that's doing the slides. Yeah, if you could let Jackie know when you want to move the next to the next slide, Janita, then uh, she'll do that on your behalf. Uh, thank you so much. So um, my quality improvement project was based on um, looking at reducing waiting times in the emergency department, which is the place I'm currently working in as a senior staff nurse. Um, so next slide, please, Jackie. Um, so the aim uh, of the quality improvement project was to investigate factors leading to delayed ward transfers and um, discharges of uh, patients from one ward to the other or from our hospital to outside the hospital, which is what I'm working in is on um, Royal Marston Hospital. Um, so I started to see that sometimes patients come in at 8 a.m. or even earlier and they're sat on those floor chairs for around 12 or 10 to 12 hours waiting for decisions. And sometimes it's, an e it's a simple decision of being discharged home on oral antibiotics or steroids. Um, so it got to a point where I had to um, thought it's, it's really unfair, it's uncomfortable, um, it's a long wait. So I decided to look at the factors that was leading to the um, to this issue. So I used a PDSA um, cycle um, to um, involving six cycles and were utilized and investigated the um, average number of hours patients stayed in the emergency department prior to being um, either transferred or discharged. Um, monthly audits were implemented and a spreadsheet was created with the help of the ward clerk. It was a group work, it was not my own work, it was a teamwork. Um, the changes were implemented between mid of February 2021 and monitored up to June 2021. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the impact um, or slash the outcome from the, um, from the investigation was there was mainly two factors that was leading to this delay. The first factor was the fact that um, we have got consultant reviews happening usually on a daily um, once a day basis, usually in the evening. So we looked at how can we improve that and make the consultant reviews from once a day to twice a day, i.e. before lunch and one in the evening. 
And also during COVID times, there was a rule um, to, there was, it was a policy that patients to have x-rays and scans to be scheduled after lunchtime, which then meant there was more delays in producing results and making decisions. So we spoke to the radiologists, um, to the radiology department to see if we can make the scanning and everything else like x-rays scheduled earlier so we can wait for the results and get the results earlier. Secondly, we spoke to the acute oncology consultants and we tried to schedule the reviews to um, lunchtime and also to evening. So we were having twice a day reviews for patients to be seen. Um, obviously, it wasn't going to plan every single day. There were days that we went back to the um, previous rotor where we were still having consultant reviews done late, delaying discharges and decisions. But there was a significant um, reduction when, when it was done um, on a twice a day basis of consultant reviews. And when radiology appointments were scheduled to much earlier, there was a significant re a reduction in the waiting times going down from ap approximately 10 hours to almost to six to seven, um, almost some days to even two or three hours um, waiting times for patients to be discharged. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so the leadership learning that came out of this project was each team member's role was um, important, including nurses, ward clerks, um, support staff, um, doctors, radiographers. It was a multidisciplinary teamwork. Um, there was a working in close membership with um, other parts of the team and to have utilizing efficient communication skills. Um, the QI project that has been um, happening is hopefully going to be an opening for future service developments opportunities within the department um, and going looking out for future it's um sorry next slide um is to promote much earlier attendance to scans and to prompt decision making and um, promoting smooth patient flow um and ensuring that consultants obviously we do understand and they've got busy schedules, but to ensure that regular consultant reviews are encouraged within the team so appropriate and prompt decisions can be made, avoiding any further delays. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Janita. That was really excellent. And when I said before about how we can measure impact, you've really demonstrated that there, that real tangible difference that you made. Now, Liz has popped herself off mute, so that tells me Liz has got a question or a thought comment for you. So over to you, Liz. <laughs> Janita, only, only to say thank you so much. That that was a, that's a brilliant, brilliant project. Um, and you probably don't know, but I was a an ED nurse way back, and and actually those those problems have been in place for such a long time. And I, I love that you you looked at it from the position of the patient and and the fact that they were sitting waiting for a long time and and I've actually managed to take some really positive steps to improving the patient experience as well as getting the the, the flow through. I, I'm just interested to, to how, how you think you're going to be able to sustain this improvement because we all know the pressures our ED departments are, are under at the moment. It's um, it's it varies on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, um, and there are times when the unit goes, we go through like a wave. It seems that there are certain two weeks that we are kind of very calm and then it gets at the other side of the spectrum. And which in terms of that, the consultants coming to visit the patients is very delayed. Um, it is hard to sustain, but I think the um, evidence is out there um, for patients and for the staff to decide. And they have got the opportunity. They know the difference it can create. So they're hoping, I mean, there was a discussion about um, allocating to have more consultants coming into the unit. So rather than having one single consultant doing the entire clinics and attending patients, which is something they're looking at to um, implement. Um, but the radiological side has completely changed. It's now scan, scans are happening at 10 a.m., 11 a.m. rather than three and four o'clock. Um, I think fab COVID fabulous. Yeah. yeah fabulous work, Janita. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And Joan, did you have any questions, comments for Janita? Janita, you've got so many supportive comments in the chat box. Just take a moment and have a have a look at that. The uh, across the board 
you're getting accolades from your group to say what fantastic yeah. work you have done and what a wonderful presentation. You really can teach us some skills there in how to get a huge amount of information across in a very succinct way. So well done. Congratulations, Peter. And good luck for where you're going next. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I've got an interview okay. shortly, so I'll be sort of stepping out and coming back in. Take Thank care, you. Janita, and well done. Take care. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Janita. OK, so we've got an, another uh, exciting presentation now from Sakila. And Sakila is joining us from her honeymoon. Talk about dedication. So <laughs> we will uh, we'll listen intently to you, Sakila's presentation and then allow her to, to go back to us uh, celebrations. So whenever you're ready, Sakila, over to you. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Yes, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm sitting here in an Airbnb in Dorset. Um, I'm trying to stay a bit quieter as well. Um, yes, hi, I'm Sakila. I'm one of the nurses. Actually, I've now moved from Guys in St Thomas um, to Bristol where my new husband lives also. Um, so I live, uh, I work as a valve specialist nurse at the uh, Bristol Heart Institute. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, my project is about improving access to follow-up clinics for post um, TAVI patients. I'll explain a little bit about that in a moment, um, but it's just a very, I think a very apt thing at the moment in our current climate, everyone's switching to virtual clinics. So I thought I'll jump in on the bandwagon too um, and just kind of see what I can do to help patients. Um, so yes, we can have the next slide, please. So obviously we started off with an aim statement for our project, which actually was a really good way for me to get my idea on a piece of paper to try to really work out what I can do next. Um, so as there it says, hopefully by next summer, I can get our team to improve access to follow-up clinics for TAVI patients, um, basically through virtual clinics and telephone appointments um, in order to hopefully try and reduce the waiting times, which currently is about six to eight weeks. And the recommended guidelines from the ESC is about hopefully four four to six weeks and um, so I'm just trying to reduce that waiting time and of course the um, the DNA rates hopefully um, halve it which should be I think would be achievable um, and I think I should be able to make a bit more of a difference um, and basically where this came from is from a little bit of research looking at um, virtual clinics in general I think from most of the, there's definitely a general lack of data on this but from some of the research I've looked at the there's about 86 percent satisfaction rate from most virtual clinics um, and from this particular study I saw that they made a, a saving of about 68,000 in the first year which when I read I thought wow I kidding me um I knew that we were saving money in general by doing virtual clinics but um to have that kind of a saving and still have that satisfaction rate, I think is, is pretty good. Um, so I wanted to find out a little bit more basically and see what our patients in particular think about telephone appointments and virtual clinics and see if I can do anything to help. So I carried on further, but before I do carry on, let me explain to you a little bit about what tabbies are. So if I can have the next slide, please. Um, so yes, I banged on about this. Um, acronym TABIs. They're basically like having an angiogram, but instead of the outside of the heart, um, we treat the inside of the heart. Um, it's your aortic stenosis um, and the aortic valve, which supplies blood to the rest of the body. Um, and as you can see in the picture, we literally inflate a balloon up there and leave a bioprosthetic valve in situ. And hopefully that can last patients about 10 to 12 years. It's better than having an open heart surgery um, and especially uh, for our elderly patients. So as you can see, the European Society uh, of Cardiology recommends anyone over the age of 75 to have a tabby, especially if they have other comorbidities. So for I have personal you know, passion in this project because I think that's amazing because a lot of our patients, so hopefully this will keep in mind to the patient group I'm looking at, but um it's an amazing thing that we do for our elderly population but also patients with learning disabilities with patients with other comorbidities which mean that they can't undergo open heart procedures but I can go on about this so we'll move on <laughs> and next thank you 
And um, so, of course, the academy taught us um, in, in, in depth about the PDSA cycle, which was really helpful. Um, as the, you know, it's a simple um, way to look at your ideas and to keep going with your idea, which is amazing. So as you can see, I did, my cycle starts from the left hand side at cycle one. I did a little bit of background research and from the gist of it I can gain is that there isn't much data out there. There is a couple of stuff to do with that are in England um, with um, generic uh, outpatient appointments, but not really further studies after that. And one of the things that they kind of pointed out is that it's our lack of um, perception of uh, lack of patient perception. We think patients won't like telephone appointments, but actually, what is the what is the real consensus, which is where I am at and um, so I created um, a questionnaire along with my colleagues because actually I was quite new at the time in my and my job so they helped I sat in on a lot of other clinics um, as part of my orientation and my colleagues also helped me work out what are the best questions to ask for our patients and um, so we created a questionnaire and we amended it about 10 times I think because you have to go through the quality improvement team at work and they go through uh, and the data analysis team as well and we create the most appropriate um, questionnaires so once I've done that I had that um, reviewed a couple of times and we sent them out Initially, I got about 20 results. Um, I think this was back in July. I've got I've had about 50 since so I'm still working through. Um, I'm, I'm sending altogether about 100. And um, so I'm hoping to get a good response rate, because a lot of our patients are willing. Um, and it seems that they are interested to let us know how we're doing. Um, so we then shared, so I'm at this stage where I'm about to share my interim results with our matrons and our data analysis team and our quality improvement team. Um, and taking from that, I will be able to um, get more time um, at work to do focus groups with other clinicians, including other um, ACS uh, nurses, so sorry, other cardiac nurses, registrars and consultants that do video consultations and kind of get their view on things. And then hopefully after that, I can then implement our um, a virtual clinic. So um, there's a, um, I think it's called one virtual clinic or one consultation, and they do a one year trial of this. So hopefully I'll be able to implement that and carry on with my PDSA cycle and see if that worked. And I might find that actually patients don't want it, but I will have something substantial to give and to show my seniors so we can move forward and do what's best for our patients. Um, but yes, moving on. Um, thank you. So obviously we're looking a little bit about the impact um, of having telephone appointments. It was quite good because uh, actually before I joined, we would do the team were doing telephone appointments and virtual appointments at the time anyway. So I was able to do a lot of backdated questionnaires, which was pretty good, which meant that I, I had a bit of result to show you today. So these are the 20 replies I got in July, which depicts a snapshot in patient preference. Um, as you can see, actually, um, about 50% prefer hospital appointments um, and about 40% 40, uh, 40 prefer telephone appointments. Um, but that's still a very good result in terms of you know, we often think as nurses and as clinicians, these virtual, these clinic appointments probably aren't doing as much as we think that they are. But actually, it's a close second. And maybe there's other things we can do to improve our telephone appointments to make it um, almost as good as hospital appointments. Because as the winter comes, this will be very important, I think. Um, and actually, from my results, I could see there was an 85% confidence in the nurse during the telephone consultations. Um, and so these are post-TAVI follow-up questionnaire, um, follow-up appointments. So after they've had their procedures and how they're getting on. Um, and an overall 52% um, very good care rate and a 47% good care rate. Um, at the moment, I've just shown you there is our 4% DNA rate. I'm hoping to halve that to about 2%, um, which wouldn't be, I think would be achievable if I can fine tune our telephone virtual appointments. Um, and that's basically my goal. Um, so then moving on to the next slide, please. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to briefly touch on, obviously, our leadership learning. Now, I mean, it's kind of crazy, the journey we've all had. Um, I genuinely didn't think I was going to be learning this much. Um, I don't know how everyone else felt, but um, I, it for me now feels like um, 
that there isn't anybody I couldn't ask you know in the past maybe I would have sat in these meetings and thought oh there's um there's a deputy chief nurse and I couldn't I could possibly never ask her you know what but there isn't there isn't and there is no proverbial ceiling we all are entitled and completely within our rights to ask these questions to be present in these rooms to to make the changes that we want to um, yes, definitely as a band five, I thought I, I couldn't ask those questions. Um, and a little bit about um, learning about political animals helped me to understand that. Yeah. Because, you know, yes, maybe I was definitely a sheep um, following along and fairly innocent about everything. And then I think I learned a little bit more about, you know, my role and my skills were improving, yes. But now that I can see the, you know, um, the owl sitting there in the right top corner, it's definitely something I want to achieve. You know, it's it's a goal that's like no other. You know, it's a it's it's like a um, a character goal that you never wish you never thought you'd had. You know, and I definitely want to get to that point. And and that involves me learning from everyone, um, from from my colleagues today. You know, I've definitely built a network, and I'm so I feel so much better knowing that they're sitting and listening right now um, and seeing their faces make me feel really good. And I feel like I have definitely reached a level of confidence that mean that I can ask those questions. Um, and my presence is justified and, and the audience that I seek are definitely mine. And the and for me to be a leader in my field is definitely understandable. It's definitely what I should be doing. It's not out of reach, it's not out of bounds. That's all I can say to everyone. Everyone can do it. It's not it's not anything strange or untoward. Um, but so I'll just follow on to my next slide. Um, I think it's just talking about the next steps um, just because this is a good way to round off. I'm nowhere near to finishing my project. I'm nowhere near getting to understand exactly where it will lead me. But as you can see, um, I've completed some questionnaires. I'll send them again in six months. And, and then that six months time, we will be in the winter period. So there will be a trip period where I might not even have the time to send out these questionnaires I'll probably send to ICU to cover you know the shortages but that's okay and hopefully I can still try and do a few things on the side and then I'm going to be arranging focus groups with my team members virtually of course um, and hopefully discuss those findings quite soon actually and then look at the DNA rates over the next 12 months and um, and continue to send those um uh, s surveys out uh, and then again review the review my whole project um through the pdsa cycle and continue to implement it but i know there's going to be difficulties um and i'm hoping i can persevere still um but yes um so lastly my last slide are there any questions um i thought that was pretty good that was amazing <laughs> Fantastic. Well done, Sakila. Wow, what energy in your presentation there. I think you had everybody completely hooked on a topic that I had absolutely no idea about before you started 10 minutes ago. <laughs> that was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. My my reflection, what I took from that, Sakila, was about how you see the power of data. You're using your data to have influence and then insisting that you have a place around the table for people to listen and I just absolutely loved that. Now whilst you were speaking we were joined by Greta Westwood our chief exec and I'm pretty sure Greta will have uh, some thoughts and reflections questions for you so I'll I'll shout out to Greta if she's there. I am there Gemma. Hi there. I had a bit of a problem with Zoom then I could hear the presentation but I couldn't see anything so I've come out and come back in again anyway thank you Gemma and I know um, the, all of you on this call uh, I'll just say this because Gemma will tell me off otherwise I'm not allowed to say too much because you're on a tight schedule and I can't help myself the reason I can't help myself say much is because I can see this over 60 people on this call okay some of those will be the the the, uh, our staff members but actually the most of the, the cohorts must be here so really well done for coming on the call um, so I'm not going to say too much because I get told off um, and I really just wanted to say thank you I, wa I want to say thank you for for just being you for giving everything you possibly could to this program and that last presentation I agree with you Gemma my god you have absolutely got every right to be at the table 
I was blown away. I, you could conv convince me to invest in anything. So whether <laughs> yeah. you had that before, whether you had it as part of the program, really in, a, a fabulous outcome. So um, yeah, thank you for being you. Thank you for investing in this program, for giving in, giving up your time and, and, and your energy and doing these incredible projects. It sounds like you've had a ball. I know it's been really hard over the last 18 months, but thank you for dedicating some of your career to this leadership program. And, and the other thank you is to, to Liz, of course, Liz Fenton for agreeing to fund this program in 2018. And, and I know that Liz turns up on every celebration day and she's just delighted to see the outcome of the investment. And I think she'd probably agree with me. It's more than we ever anticipated. And in 2018, when we first ha had the first program and Liz and I interviewed um, all, all the particular participants, we picked up people who had twinkle, twinkles in their eyes. And I think, my God, goodness, as the t years have gone on, we have we could pick so many people now who've, who've got twinkles in the eyes. So it's just amazing that what you do, what you've done, um, your your enthusiasm for making sure that you could be the best nurse ever is is incredible and and that really makes my heart sing and I probably would say that of Liz's Liz too because that was the that was our ambition and my ambition still my manifesto will be always to invest in nurses and midwives who come from cultural diverse backgrounds um so um never let go of this passion you've got it in spades you've got it in bundles and and if any if the presentation last presentation is anything to go by i think um you would be able to convince anyone to do anything for you so we want you to create a network because you are even more f formidable within a network and and please stay connected with it with each other please stay connected with me and if I could be so, um, if you could indulge me for two seconds, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll realize that I've been training jolly hard for the London Marathon. And if at the end of this program, you've if even got a few pennies to spend on sponsoring me, I'd be absolutely delighted. I'm trying to raise money to fund a scholarship for next year. And it would be amazing if any one of you um, were able to apply next year. So you've had a fabulous um, six month program. Don't let go of the passion, keep going. You, you've got energy in, in spades and um, I, I love it as well, as well as Liz and Gemma and everybody else on our team to see you becoming um, even bigger and, and, and creeping up that career pathway. And if we can support you, that's our ambition. So listen, have a great rest of the day. I'm sorry I can't be there for much longer because I've got to go and talk to the um, RCN International Research Conference, but otherwise I'd be on the, I love it. It's just, it's, this is why we do our job. So thank you, thank you again. And I can't see Liz, but bye-bye Liz, thanks. Thank you so much, Greta. So as I said earlier, you will hear Greta's commitment uh, to this agenda. And, um, and that foresight over three years ago to join together with HE and with Liz's support to really invest in, in this programme and, and sustain that development opportunities for those of you that were at bands five, six and seven. So we're developing that pipeline for the senior nurse leaders of the future. So brilliant. Thank you so much, Greta, for joining us. We'll see you later on. And good Bye -bye. luck with your presentation. <laughs> Sakila, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. And also thank you to you for putting everything that Rada taught you uh, into practice there. We were all completely hooked <laughs> and engaged. And make sure you have a look at the chat box before you disappear off and back to your honeymoon. Take care, Sakila. Well done. OK, let's move on to our next presenter. We have James up next. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you whenever you're ready. Over to you. Okie dokes. Can I see my slide? Um, right. Hello, everyone. My name is James. So first of all, I would like to thank the foundation for giving me this platform to share my humble piece of work. So on the left hand side of your screen is my QI poster. So the title of my project is called Promotion Interventions on the Level of Motivation Amongst 
among staff and the level of motivation in the workplace among staff at Central Operating Recovery. Next slide, please. Next slide, sorry. So if you may ask, um, why did I choose this project? All I can say is it boils down to COVID-19. Because of the pandemic, it leads to the low motivation levels among staff in the workplace. And this was supported by the NHS staff survey. And locally speaking, in the, the recovery workforce were sent to critical care areas for staffing support. And earlier this year, when we thought that we were reaching the end of the tunnel already, we were confronted with another challenge. And that is um, the and that is because of the, the catching up with the elective surgeries and the waiting list. And as a result, it affected the motivation levels among recovery staff. So what we were trying to accomplish here, so my aim statement was in central operating recovery area, we will increase the staff motivation by 10%. We hope to achieve this increase at one month post staff will be promotion interventions. And this was measured by the following metrics. They're looking forward to go to work, their enthusiasm about their jobs, and whether their time passes quickly when they are working. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. Uh, yeah. So what, what changes we, are make, we made? What were my PDSAs? So I initially started with the baseline, the gathering of the baseline data using the benchmark summary report. And then it was followed by the team meeting informing everyone in the department that I'm going to implement the quality improvement project and, and, and for them to expect some changes in the next few weeks. Following the team meeting, I did the staff will being bulletin. I also did the thank you cards. I distributed some fun trivia increases at work. And lastly, I did a post COVID staff nomination awards and every after PDSA, I measured the motivation levels among staff through a survey. So next slide, please. So the million pound question is, were my project, was, was the project successful or not? My answer would be yes and no. No in a sense, no in a sense that I wasn't able to increase the motivation levels among staff in recovery by 10%. However, if you, Look at the line graph from PDSA2 where I implemented the staff will be in bulletin, going to PDSA5 where I implemented the nomination awards, you can see some gradual increase in terms of motivation levels among staff in recovery. And this will be supported by the numbers that you can see on the upper right table on the, with the yellow heading. If you shift your attention to the lower ta right table at, with the black heading, the post QI numbers in terms of motivation levels were actually higher compared to the, to the organization numbers, our organization, which is the Newcastle Trust in terms of motivation levels. Moreover, the, the post QI numbers were actually higher compared to the average motivation levels across the NHS. Hence, I could, I could say that there were some positive changes with my projects in terms of motivation levels. Next slide, please. So this slide will show you the great comments that, that the project received from my, my co colleagues when I implemented a project. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to read through. Next slide, please. So what were my leadership learning? I learned, I learned the value of um, staff engagement and, keep to ever, keep, and keeping everyone informed. I learned that um, st uh, time, constraints, time constraints were the main issue, were the main challenge of, during my implementation of my project because I only got one month, one month to implement my project before I start my current role. And and the wider picture as to why the motivation levels was low in the department was partially addressed because the main demotivating factor was um, understaffing and heavy workloads. Next slide, please. 
So what were my next steps? So I presented the final results to the department for project sustainability. And the numbers were, were used as baseline data for staff forum for meetings to deal with the morale in the department. And just a bit of an update last week, the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian went to our department, well, to the directory to listen to staff concerns. So that was a plus. I proposed an appointment of mental health champion in the department. I also proposed identification of staff specific professional learning behaviors to boost motivation levels. And I'm proud to do to say this that I managed to liaise with different trust stakeholders. And just when I received the email that I, I was given the opportunity to, to present, for some reason, the message got sent to the, our chief nurse, and she was thinking of sharing my project to a wider picture, to the wider for a wider presentation. And lastly, I proposed a coordination between um, between um, between different departments. Because um, basically the recovery department was overwhelmed. So, and since we did our part of helping other departments during the height of the pandemic, now was the perfect time to do the favor. And funny because after my presentation of my results, just a week after one member of staff from that department gave a feedback to me that um, ITU staff, ITU staff, anesthetic staff, scrub, the scrub team goes to the department to, to help out for during during when the when the department is overwhelmed. And yeah, coordination with between functional emergency and operating theater list because and and I am humble to say this as well that at the moment it's been actually been happening because um basically the recovery staffing is just a bit um a bit sad. So yes, um I'm happy to say that it's all happening. So next slide, please. And that is the last slide. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Thank you so much, James. Excellent. Well done. Big round of applause to you. I mean, I, I picked up from the chat box, um, James, about, about people's reflections on your dedication and commitment to your colleagues in this time and the priority that you placed on their well-being and their morale and how important that that is and 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 I think real credit to you for recognizing the importance of that at this time uh, when other people are thinking more about the task you were focused on the people so thank you for absolutely for doing that are there any questions from the audience for James? Anybody would like to, we'll open it up. Anybody would like to either pop your hand up, wave at me, pop it in the chat box. You're very welcome to ask James a question there. Um, can I just say, um, James, that it was really great work that you've done. And don't think that it's been unsuccessful because it was only over a short period of time. And although you had a, a measurement of 10%, in, in improvement in people's well-being you have shifted people along and maybe if we look at it in a couple more months time if with a longer time frame you might be noticed it would have a cumulative effect and it would have it would have an impact on more people so don't think it wasn't successful it was very good and it will continue thank you thank you Joan. thank I, you I, I mean it was an ongoing process i mean all the, the rest of my PDSA are still happening at the moment and the main issues which was understaffing and heavy workloads were addressed already. So hopefully if we measured the motivation levels again by this rate, I, I would imagine it would be higher. I agree, James, and I do wonder whether you mitigated some of the negative impact during that COVID period. So uh, even by sustaining motivation levels during a time where in other areas, I would imagine they would have dropped significantly. Uh, that's an impact, isn't it? Sometimes it's not about an increase, it's about maintenance during a difficult time. Yeah. Well done, brilliant work, and thank you so much. I do really hope that you will continue this momentum. It's so, 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 so important. Thank you very much, James. Well to done. Be honest, to be honest, I'm um, because of my new role at the moment, I, I'm making another project. Yeah. So, um, um, because I'm because I because of the pro because of the foundation, I've I gained the confidence to you know to to do some changes within the organization. So the project that I'm working now is um, 
will be about the workforce again. So I am creating projects about harassment and bullying in, and microaggressions in the workplace. And basically just to incre increase awareness because going back to the NHS staff survey again, the numbers are just getting worse mm -hmm. over the past five years. But um, on the other side of the boat, maybe it's a matter of maybe the staff are learning how learning now how to speak up. Yeah. So that's it's more like adding adding to the data, giving, uh, getting into the bottom line as to why is that happening. Yeah, yeah, fantastic, James. Thank you. And it, it's so it's like the momentum's there now, isn't it? You've identified that this is this is an area that you can influence, and you're investing that energy in that, which is just fabulous. Thank you so much. I Thank hope you. the foundations played a part in that. <laughs> Yes. Well done. Thank you. OK, Thank you. so our next presenter is Rosie. Rosie, are you there? Brilliant. Um, yeah, Being hello. <laughs> Welcome, Rosie. Whenever you're ready, over to you. Thank you. Um, sorry, my presentation probably isn't as exciting as everyone else's this morning, um, but we'll we'll go with it. Um, so I'm Rosie and I'm one of the Safeguarding Children Specialist Nurse Practitioners at Bradford Teaching Hospitals. Um, I actually did my project whilst I was a Safeguarding Children's Nurse Advisor at Leeds, um, but since finishing this, well, since submitting, I've got a new job and I've moved back to Bradford. Um, so my project was around was not brought and if you're not sure of what not, uh, uh, let me put my teeth in if you're not sure of what was not brought is then if you think of DNA everybody knows what DNA is it's either around genetics or it's a did not attend an appointment so I'm going with the did not attend can I have the next slide please so unfortunately we see a lot of and it's it's my job to deal with with child abuse um, and you know hidden hidden abuse, um, so the the aim of the project and the pathway um, was to kind of highlight two clinicians dealing with people not attending their appointments um, and what we do about that. What you know, do we just code them on our system as a did not attend? A two year old can't decide whether they're going to attend or not. It's not up to that two year old. It's not also up to um, maybe an elderly patient who relies on somebody else to bring them to their appointment. So we really need to be thinking about our vulnerable people who we do see and make sure that we're safeguarding them as medical neglect is a massive, massive problem. And it's easy for me to be passionate about it and to talk everyone's you know ears off about it because I do it every single day, whereas the clinicians on the front line or at a, who are working with these patients, safeguarding is a kind of a tiny little part of their job. Um, so our, my job is to, to help them and hopefully this pathway would help. So like the picture, um, we, we were trying to trigger an alternative mindset around DNA. So DNA, we're not really like to use that term anymore. As like I said, a two-year-old can't decide whether they're gonna attend or not. Whereas if we change the coding, and our mindsets onto was not brought that automatically triggers something in our brains. So at Leeds, we have two separate programs that we used and the routine booking system used one called PAS. So we had to work with the IT, with data analysis, with everybody to try and get was not brought put onto the system. So we're actually helping trigger that little bit of mindset. Can I have the next slide, please? I'm feeling very quick. Chris Witter. <laughs> um, so these these pictures were just kind of like um, a prompt for me. So I did my PDSA cycle, um, and from what you can see, I, I wrote it down. Um, so we we had to do quite a few, um, and they were all done on official kind of on paperwork. Um, but what I did was I actually worked really closely with the head of safeguarding for the trust, who was the head of nursing, Karen Sykes, who was just the most amazing professional ever. Um, and we were actually doing the COVID-19 vaccination programme at Leeds. So I'd only just started in the trust in the November, got accepted onto the Windrush course in the December, and then um, started vaccinating at like the end of January. And I can remember doing our first session with the Windrush. And I said to Karen, I've got a quality improvement project to do. And I don't, I don't know anyone at this trust. I don't know who to speak to or what to do. And I thought, oh, if I come in and start making a massive change, people are going to think, who is this? Anyway, she supported me and she said, I've got an idea. 
she wanted to know about it and we talk, started talking about what's not brought and then she supported me massively in kind of instigating who we need to speak who we need to speak to what we need to do and she really really championed this project so we opened up um, a was not brought working group and I've never had anything to do with anything kind of middle management or higher management so it was it really opened my eyes um to what to what you kind of discuss and the strategical elements of it um, and we had some amazing, amazing people as part of the working group. We had um, the named GP for safeguarding children for Leeds. We had matrons of elderly care. Um, we had ma- head of nursing. There was a lot of people there. And I did feel quite overwhelmed at one point because I thought, oh, my goodness, like I'm treading water here. But the working groups were absolutely incredible and they all knew about the project. And we all decided on a project plan and what we were going to do and each step of how we were going to do that. And we put it into a big calendar of when things need to be done and who needs to do them, which was which was brilliant. We also got um, patient experience on our side and started attending the working groups. Um, And as you can see there, the survey, they actually helped us put a survey together and that survey went out on a global email to the whole of the trust. And there's 18,000 members of staff at Leeds. um, So they'll have all got that email. And the survey, um, we, me and Karen sat down with um, the head of quality improvement at the trust and decided what we were gonna ask people. Because I think sometimes when there's non-attendance of appointments, um, people can have quite strong views on that because it is, you know, a financial implication, it's massive and it's people's time as well. But we wanted to shift that mindset to actually what's happening to that patient and do they actually really need to be seen and what else is going on? Um, So we tried to do the questions of, yes, okay, you can get your rant out about not attending, but also what impact is this having on that child or that person not being bar um, and within three days of that email going out we had 98 responses um, and then which was we didn't think we'd get that much to be honest because it was just part of a long email um, and then our safeguarding um, midwife sent it out again to all of the midwives um, again who have appointments um, and people don't always attend and we then got 120 responses in total so we were able to to really kind of get the key points of that so this project will take years and we will get measurable you know outcomes maybe next year and the year after um just to put it into perspective last year from may 20 to may 2021 there was um 80 88,000 appointments in the trust which were coded as a did not attend so the main measurable is we're not going to change I'm not out there to change the attendance of appointments, but what I'm out there to change is the coding and the thinking behind that and thinking behind, well, actually, does that family have a social worker? Is that elderly person actually able to get out of the house or are they being abused? And just thinking about those things to just trigger and even to contact the safeguarding team to say, I'm not actually quite sure on that. Um, so for example last week I had um, the orthopedic department ring me who said this child 12 year old child hasn't attended the last three appointments and I said okay well let's pull it back let's think about what what are we actually concerned about let's really think about what you know have they got a cast on and are we going to get pressure areas from this actually if we are we're really concerned about that child's welfare but this this child actually he was absolutely fine. He had no cast on, he'd had an x-ray and I think mum had just been so busy, she'd just completely forgotten about the appointment and thought, well, he's fine, he's using his arm. So it's just changing that mindset. I think it's it's going to be a big work in progress. The team behind it are absolutely amazing um, and I'm now trying to implement the same in Bradford. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So this is what I learned. I thought it's just easier just to pin everything down. Um, so from the days that we had with the King's Fund, with RADA, it, I have to completely admit and hands up, I did not expect my career journey to change as much as it has with this project. Um, I can remember Hannah Spencer, um, who came on one of the days with the King's Fund and oh my goodness, I want to be Hannah. I'm like fangirling. She's just amazing. Um, she said, bring your chair to the table. Don't, be, don't wait to be invited. 
and she, I'd had that session just before I had my interview at Bradford um, for my current job and I absolutely walked in there and I took my chair to the table um, and I was very passionate about everything and I got the job um, we learn about energies how to maximize your impact and the main thing for me is networking how to breathe which I'm not doing now which my group will absolutely know that I can't do um, but be prepared and the the biggest thing is, is being brave and what's the worst that's going to happen um, and we have we have to be brave to make the change and to suggest change um, so yeah next slide please so that's just my journey um, where you know in I've qualified in 2017 and now I'm absolutely in a role that I wanted to be in and absolutely you know I was so focused to get in and I didn't think I'd get there um and that's yeah I mean in Leeds I was only there for nine months but I feel like I've made a massive massive impact um already um so yeah I, th I think I've covered stuff I don't who knows <laughs> but that's that's my project brilliant Rosie thank you so much thank massive, you. <laughs> massive well done there just absolutely fantastic and I'm going to absolutely ban you from starting a presentation saying this is not as interesting <laughs> as the people's because that was absolutely just so engaging. And I think the, the reason for that is because of your passion and the way that you present the nature of this change and the impact it will have by thinking about those individual families and, and people. It just, it, it drew us all in and we could completely get behind your cause. I can imagine that that's where your supports come from because you speak with so much passion about this. Brilliant work, really, really well, well done you. Thank you. So some questions for Rosie. Shall I first of all invite, oh, Liz has just said, I was going to say the same thing. Let me uh, invite Liz to comment there. I was just going to say exactly the same thing, Rosie. I, I, I loved your learning and, and, and the fact that you, you're going to try and be really brave. So let's start by not caveating it. Don't, don't <laughs> talk yourself down. <laughs> that was a brilliant piece of work. Thank you. Um, and, and just so important to, and focusing on those most vulnerable that, that we, we care for um, and and, and shifting that focus from, from DNA to thinking about why is this child or elderly person not coming? So really, really powerful. And, and I think something that could be replicated wider than your own organisation as well. So thank you for that brilliant work. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And, and a message from Lucy in the audience, Lucy Brown, who's our Deputy Director of Academy. And I can imagine this was very close to your heart. Lucy, did you have a comment question for Rosie? Yeah, Rosie, I'm, um, well, I actually work with Hannah Spencer as well, so I know her well. I wanted to oh, say amazing. that to you as well. She's wonderful <laughs> and so inspiring. So I was, I was quite fortunate to work with Hannah. But I was a former National Safeguarding League, so your work is absolutely oh, wow. critical in signposting. I've worked in the independent sector, but I work, obviously work for the foundation now. But something I'm so passionate about is safeguarding. So to hear your work just warms my heart, and I know it has such an impact. Um, and to Liz's point, you really should be sharing this work uh, more widely, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to work with you on that. That would be amazing. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And a, a note there from Shamila as well, working in a mental health setting, lots to be learned from this. I, I completely agree. Shamila, I'm a mental health nurse. I was thinking exactly the same thing. One of, um, one of the criteria often for accessing mental health services attendance uh, appointments. And uh, if people don't attend consecutively, they're just discharged. And, and obviously that can, can, there can be a whole raft of reasons as to why those people aren't able to make their appointments. So, um, so yeah, loads of transferability. As Lucy said, we would love to help you share the learning. Well done you, Rosie. Fantastic Thank you. Work. Thank you. And our last presenter today is Perla. So Perla, can I welcome you to the screen? Hello. There you are. Over to you, Perla. Hello, pleasant day to everyone. I'm very happy to see each everyone. And I'm just sad that we weren't able to see each other face to face, but hopefully we can set up something else and to, to, to do a proper celebration. Anyways, um, so the, the title of my project is Improving Staff Experience 
on completion of e-learning. Um, healthcare moves with a wave of change to achieve the delivery of high level of care. Um, thanks to e-learning, um, the traditional learning approach is enhanced by a cost-effective, flexible, accessible learning tool for all members of staff. And even though e-learning is a very fantastic tool, there's still some non-compliance with the staff. And this is the reason why I have a look at why this is the case and how compliance can be improved and the experience can be improved as well. The project aim is to comply with the requirement of the unit to achieve about 96% compliance for the individual or monthly assessment. The baseline of this study is an ongoing project. So the pro so the um, it provides information uh, depending on the daily activity of the human unit allowance and, and how to collect the data and monitor the desired outcomes. So what I did and the approach that we did is the staff have been given a specific uh, e-learning allocated time during quiet shifts. That's, that's the key, a bit of quiet shifts. But you never said quiet in the shift, especially in ICU. A uh, second uh, approach would be PDSA2 is the using the group, uh, communication ICU group app and uh, to get to gain access on e-learning from home. A third one is designating an e-learning champion or a go-to person that would be me and that has been uh, nominated to monitor compliance of the individual and also as the unit as a whole. Support is the um, following up of group members at to, to have the updates in a quarterly reminder. And fifth is to, we have an ICUI newsletter and uh, we included that to include uh, all the questions regarding the booking, the enrolling and person specific training. Third, uh, third slide, please. So in this third slide, uh, I tabulated the responses of the staff to the number, to the um, number of staff, um, such as the specific person training, being more interactive, being more friendly and allocated time, and other of these, uh, other of the responses of the staff. Fourth slide, please. And so in this fourth slide, I charted the result of the responses on how e-learning can be improved. It's quite self-explanatory, as you can see in the slide. Uh, on, the, on the next slide, please. So the impact of this project is one of the member staffs very ecstatic. Um, he was able to um, achieve 100% compliance. With, this, is, this is probably not big to others, but this is very big to him because um, this is his first time to, to, com to have that 100% compliance. This is due to having a specific allocated time in the unit to complete the addition, to, com to complete the e-learning and also to have this, that support and guidance that has been offered to him from the enrollment to the class and to completing of the course. By giving allocated time, spending time um, getting familiar with the e-learning system and having a go-to person and having an e -remi email reminders gave the, the most impact from, um, from, from the projects. Um, fifth slide, please. Um, I will gonna leave you with this quote um, from Michelangelo. Uh, I'm still learning at the age of 87. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Perla. Well done. Really interesting project. It's such an essential aspect, isn't it, of our day-to-day our -day and uh, often not prioritised there. But when we look at critical incident analysis, often it goes back to whether people had access to that essential training. So it's, uh, it's so key and often not given the attention that it should be. Thank you for putting the spotlight around the importance of this and thinking much more in depth about how we can improve access and engagement. So some questions for Perla. Joan, I wonder if you have any questions for Perla. No, we don't have Joan. Oh, there she is. Sorry, are you asking me? Yes, if you yeah, <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm just, no, that was really good. Fantastic work that she's done. Absolutely brilliant, yeah. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. And any comments from you, Liz? Oh, let me just get off. Yeah, and Perla, that that was brilliant work, and actually really resonated with me because you 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 may not know, but HEE 
hosts the e-learning for health platform. So we develop a lot of this e-learning material, um, but, but actually having a real focus on, on how you're using it within your team to really have an impact on, on patient care is, is so important. What a great piece of work. And I think there's, there's lots of learning for other areas. So absolutely well done. And I love your quote at the end. I'm going to, I'm going to borrow that. <laughs> That's 87. That's 80, always, forevermore. Thank you yeah. so much. Well done, Perla. Really excellent, really excellent work. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our presentations and we'll just pause for a moment now um, to give you a chance to undertake a short questionnaire. This is all part of our evaluations of the impact of these programmes. You completed a questionnaire right at the beginning of the programme, which was called Pre-Impact. This is the post-impact questionnaire. So we're going to give you 15 minutes now to either follow this link or scan the QR codes on your phone and complete that questionnaire so that we can start to measure the difference that this program has made to you. And we'll also follow this up with you in six months time as well to see if there's been any continued impact for you. So whilst you're doing that, grab a coffee, have a stretch, um, a walk away from, from the screen as well. And when we come back at half past 11, we'll be hearing from the fantastic Joan Myers. So see you all in 15. I'm absolutely can't wait to hear what you've got to share with the group today, because I just know how inspirational you are as a speaker. And for me, that's about your integrity. And I see that integrity in every element of the work that you are influencing currently. And I feel so privileged we have that influence within the foundation. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Well, you did a fantastic introduction earlier on. I was thinking, wow, who's she talking about? <laughs> but it's a real privilege and an honour to be um, doing this keynote speech this morning and well done to all of you that have done your projects so QI projects the ones that I've heard absolutely phenomenal you're all making changes and you're all leaving a legacy because you're all doing things that are bringing about major changes so that's fantastic I'm going to do um, a talk on leaving a legacy in nursing because everything we do is not for ourselves it's for other people and we leave something behind and the fact that you're part of the Florence Nightingale Foundation the Illumini where you're making an impact that's going to have effects rippling effects across all the areas of your influence right into the future and um, the slide that I put up I was asked to do a talk on the legacy in nursing for um, another group recently and it came to my mind all those badges that I've got and they're all in the little container in the box in the corner. So I took them all out and then I decided I'll um, do my talk alongside the badges. But just to say at the beginning, I put all my titles there because you never often as a nurse, we don't actually get to share our, all the different things that we do. Everybody just calls us a nurse and we're just a nurse. But I'm really, really proud to have my master's, have a doctor, honorary doctorate. And the thing is, because when I was at school, I was told I was below O-level standard and incapable of writing an essay. And my mother was advised to let me leave school because I was wasting my time, their time and her time. And I had to beg my mum to give me another chance. And I thought, I'm gonna prove them all wrong. And no matter what anybody says to you throughout your career, it's not up to them, it's up to you. So even though they might say that you're bad and you're useless and you're worthless and you're not good, that's what they say, but you just have to prove them wrong. And so that's why I like to put all my little titles there just if you see um but i'm going to run through my um career history and um, using my badges as an example um so just to say that I, I qualified as a nurse in 1985 i always wanted to be a nurse from the age of three and actually when i was um 11 years old my mother did her nurse training and she advised me not to do nursing she told me that you're going to really hate it. They're going to treat you really bad. They're all racist. It's not nice. And I goes, no, I don't want to be anything else but a nurse. And she made me promise to do the registered general nursing, where there was two levels of nursing then, just like it is now. But there was a um, state enrolled nursing and the state registered nursing. And uh, she told me not to be an enrolled nurse. She was, she was an enrolled nurse, a state enrolled nurse. And they're the brilliant nurses. They're the practical nurses. They're absolutely phenomenal in what they do. But there's less opportunity to go up the career ladder on that scale. So it's like being a nursing associate, it's a bit more challenging to go up the ladder, although you can, but it's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. 
So she made me promise that I would do the registered general nursing, which I did. And even at my interview, they advised me, why do um, a three year course when you could do a two year course? And because my mother told me, just make sure you do the state registered nursing. I said, no, no, I've got my five O levels. I've got more than five O levels. I'm gonna, I want to do the registered general nursing, whereas lots of my um, fellow nurses that I know, black nurses particularly, were advised to do the enrolled nursing. So I was one of very few black nurses at the time that did registered general nursing. So I was always been used to being like the only darkie in the village, as I could say, um, the only black nurse around in most of the areas that I've worked in. But I qualified 1985, then I specialised in my paediatric nursing, and then I became a Christian and I wanted to go to church on Sunday. But in those days, they didn't have flexible working like they do now. And the sister on the ward told me that I could never be a nurse working nine to five, Monday to Friday with every weekend off. And I should have thought about that before I did nursing. I said, well, I didn't know before then, did I? And I said, I don't want every weekend. Just give me one weekend off a month at least. And if they didn't like you, there was nobody to monitor what was going on. So... They didn't like me because I was very grumpy. I was always talking, as you could tell. I was always talking, always asking questions. But why do you do it like this? I don't know why you're doing it like that. And they couldn't explain to me why they did things the way they did it when I had ideas of how it could be done differently. So I, I worked every single weekend, but I always find a way out and a way around. She told me I couldn't work nine to five, Monday to Friday, nine to five as a nurse. And I said, well, I don't really want to, but because you said I can't, I will. And I, somebody wrote an unpublished um, dissertation about working in the community. So I decided that I wanted to be a paediatric home care nurse, but there were not many of them around at the time. So I wrote my own job description and I sent it to all the health authorities in London. And while I was waiting to hear from them, I, I was the senior staff nurse on the ward and I asked if I could do the off-duty rotor. And they said, yes because nobody, nobody liked doing the rota. And I went around and I asked everybody, what days off do you want? What days do you want to work? Who wants to work on my Sunday? I'll work on your Friday, I'll work on your Saturday, if only I can have Sunday off. So for six weeks in a row, I had every Sunday off and everybody was happy because they don't, they don't want to work on the Friday or Saturday, they want to go out on the town. And I didn't want to work on the Sunday because I wanted to go to church. But then the sister on the ward found out and said, Joan, I told you, you cannot work nine to five, Monday to Friday with every weekend's off. And I said, okay. But I wrote out my own job description, nine to five, Monday to Friday, nine to five, pediatric home care nurse, sent it to all the health authorities in London saying, this is what I want to do, have you got a job? Didn't hear from any of them. Well, I heard from one telling me no, but the others didn't bother to respond. But my friend got a job working in Camberwell and I thought, Camberwell Health Authority, I haven't written to them. So I phoned them up. I found their number in the yellow pages. I don't know they have yellow pages now. Phoned up the HR department, said, I want to be a pediatric home care nurse. Have you got a vacancy? They said it sounded like something they were advertising. The closing date was the day before. And I said, just send it to me now. I'll, I promise you I'll send it. I'll fill it in straight away and send it in. And I think they just wanted to get me off the phone. And then they didn't send it to me. But 10 days later, so you have to be persistent, insistent, and consistent. I phoned them up. I said, I know where you are. You promised me the application form. I'm coming to get it. They said, no, 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 we'll send it. They sent it to me. I went for an interview for the paediatric home care team nurse. The, the job description was practically the spitting image of my job description. It was nine to five, Monday to Friday, every weekend's off. And it was, I was an F grade nurse at the time. F grade is like a band six, seven. And this job was for G grade, which is more like a um, seven or eight, band eight, A level. And I said, I, I went for the interview. They asked me all these questions. They said, what research have you read recently that's changed your views about nursing? really important read research read articles and i talked about working in the in the, in the pediatric home care team and i spoke like i knew what i was talking about i was just talking about what i read in the research and at the end they asked me have you got any questions now i didn't know at the time when you go for an interview and they ask you have you got any questions it's your opportunity to interview them but i didn't realize that i just said I've got no questions to ask you, but I'll just let you know that I'm going to take this job, but I'm only taking it on condition that you sponsor me to do my district nursing course. Because at that time, the only com community courses was district nursing or health visiting, or yeah, district nursing or health visiting. There wasn't a pediatric a community children nursing course. And they said, we've got many app app applicants, we let you know. So five days later or five days, a week later, they phoned me up, offered me the job. 
asked me to start in a month's time. I said, no, no, I need to start now. I've handed in my notice. I've got no money. I need to start. They said, no, no, you need some time. I said, no, no, I need to start now. So the day I started, they just said, the pediatric home care team starts the day with you. Get the paperwork, get the pa patients and tell everybody about it. And it was at that point that I realized that I didn't actually know anything about working in the community because I trained in the hospital, I did my general training um, to be a general nurse and then did a paediatric course. I was working at Guy's Hospital on a plastic surgery ward. I worked in paediatric A&E, plastic surgery and cardiology. I didn't have a clue about what happens in the community. But you don't, it doesn't matter because there's somebody else that does have a clue. And the guy that wrote the unpublished dissertation, I actually went to visit him and he was working at St Mary's in in Paddington, I went to visit him. I said, could you be my mentor, please? Could you help me? I said, give me the paperwork, just tell me what to do. And he became my coach and my mentor and he helped me. And um, I set up this team. I thought the team actually existed and I was just gonna join the team. Set it up from scratch. There was one district nurse that actually had a pediatric course. We worked together, we interviewed everybody to join the team. Then they paid for me to do my district nursing course. And then I refused to be district nursing because although I was adult trained, I was a pediatric nurse and I, it was a pediatric home care team. So all my assignments to do with care of the elderly and disengagement in the elderly and dementia care, I just wrote at the top of my assignments that I will be talking about this in relation to pediatrics. And then I'll just write my own story, my own assignment. And they said it was quite refreshing to, to read something different. So I became a pediatric district nurse. And I absolutely loved it, set up the team. It was absolutely brilliant. And then the money ran out and they said, goodbye, you're the weakest link, we don't need you anymore. And they were offering me other jobs, I refused to go. Everybody went, except for me, me and one other nurse. And I said, I'm not going, this is my perfect job. You gave me a perfect role, I'm staying here. You know, she could find me something equal and equivalent elsewhere, I'm not going. And a week before the whole team was disbanded, everybody had practically gone. We weren't not allowed to tell our, the patients. We were just told to tell them to go back to the ward. Not, we weren't allowed to tell them that we actually were disbanding. And a week before, I got a phone call. But I was working in Camberwell in South London, Suffolk. They asked, I got a phone call from Lambeth telling me that they heard about the work that I've done in Camberwell. Can I come along and work for them? And I had one week to spare. And I said to them, on one condition that you give me a week off, I said, I'm stressed up to my eyeballs. I need a week off. I need my own office. I need my own computer. I need to have a phone, a mobile phone. They didn't even have mobile phones. It was like 1994 by then. There's like these big brick things and no, hardly anybody had one. And I said, I need to take my nurse with me. I had one nurse left with me. And she was just stressed out of her eyeballs. She went for 11 jobs in three months and she couldn't even think straight. And so she kept failing all her interviews. I said, but you're just absolutely brilliant. I want you to work with me. And I told him that I'd only go and work with them if she can come with me. And they said, well, she'd need to be interviewed. I didn't need to be interviewed. They just transferred me across. And I said, well, I won't work unless she works with me. They interviewed her. She failed the interview. She was just abominable because she was just stressed out. And I said, I refuse to work unless she works with me because I know she's brilliant. She was brilliant. She was just couldn't cope anymore. So they said it was on my head. If anything happened, HR processes and stuff, I'll be um, responsible. But she was absolutely brilliant. She worked with me for a couple of years and she went on to do her health visit and then she's doing really well now. But she worked with me. That's a really important thing in your career. Always take somebody along with you, support other people along the way and understand that we're all at different stages learning in different ways. But always bring somebody along with you. So that's me looking sweet there as a um, this pediatric district nurse. And then just to show you all the different roles I've had since 1985, I came out in the community in 1990. The 15th of October, 1990, I became a pediatric home care nurse and started working in the community. And from that date until today, I've, all my roles have been nine to five, Monday to Friday with every weekend off. They said I couldn't and I could. And if you look at the, the, the actual roles that are actually in bold and underlined, those roles are all brand new roles. So every role, practically every role I had in the community, when I set up the pediatric home care team in 1990, I became the community children team leader in 1994 in Lambeth, brand new team. I became the first and only nurse consultant for community children's nursing in 2003. And I became a nurse consultant for children and young people in 2014. That was a brand new role in, um, in Northeast London Foundation Trust. I became an associate director and chief nurse in 2017 as the first, the first time that role was actually developed. And it was a community interest trust 
with health education and social care all working together and I was a health lead they didn't have a health lead before it was a CQC came in and said you have to have a health lead rather than the social worker leading the nurses and so I became the associate director and chief nurse and then I became a and in that time I became a director and trustee with the Florence Nightingale Foundation but I got that chief nurse post while I was doing my Florence Nightingale course program. Program I got the actual everybody that does becomes a Florence Nightingale um, scholar. You're all on a trajectory to go up, 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 ascend, arise, and advance to the next level. It's while I was doing my project that I actually um, got that role as an associate director and chief nurse. And I think it was a, the role was an associate director for health service. But then when they saw who I was and my credentials and stuff, they just added the chief nurse bit on, which I absolutely loved, absolutely brilliant. It's fantastic. And then I, I retired from the from that role in 2019. And then actually it was last year, 2020, I set up my own company because I was doing lots of teaching and training and everything. And so now I did my own thing and I worked with the But one of the things that I'm really proud of is that in 2006, I set up a nurse-led eczema clinic and I done my nurse prescribing course. I was an advisor for the BNF for children. So if you look in the ones from 2014, 15, 16, you might see my name in the beginning. There's one in the front pages of one of the advisors. Um, I wrote a formulary for prescribing medication for children and young people with eczema in the community. They never had a nurse-led eczema clinic in Islington before I set it up. And I set it up in such a way that I was able to teach and train and support other community children's nurses and health visitors and school nurses so that they could be um, trained to do prescribing as well and manage these children in the community and it hadn't been done like that before and I was on the nice guidance for children and young people with eczema and what was amazing I was the only black person on the panel they had dermatologists nurse specialists pediatricians but I was the only black person and I actually said did you know that black skin is different to white skin and they were like yeah we know that I said that's and the reason why I'm just mentioning it is because the skin is different in black people compared to white people so it presents differently and that's why most GPs are misdiagnosing eczema in children as being scabies or ringworms or whatever else and so you need to acknowledge that the skin is different so it presents differently so that's why you need to be aware of that and also black skin actually needs more emollients oily creams rather than um white drying creams, the creams you put on and it sinks in the skin and, and it's no longer there. We're used to having like oily stuff in our skin. And because I said that on that panel, somebody mentioned about being around a table. My thing is that there needs to be representation, diversity represented at all levels of decision making. So on panels and committees and boards, there needs to be somebody there that would actually speak up on behalf of different people. If, you, otherwise you get into group think and you don't think outside the box and you don't think outside of what you can see in front of you. Because I said that, they wrote it in the NICE guidance um, to children from African, Caribbean and Asian background, they need to look at, their, look, at, look at their skin differently. And as a result, GPs now pick up on it. And it's like all GP practices know that and the pediatricians and stuff like that know that, that they need to think about that. Um, the skin content, the skin of the, uh, the color of the skin, because obviously you can't see things in exactly the same way if you've got a different tone of skin. So I was really proud of being a part of that. And um, I'm really proud of being an ambassador for the Mary Seacole Statue of Pills, because although I knew about Florence Nightingale from the time I did my training, I did not learn about Mary Seacole until 2004. So I became an ambassador and I was selling all these badges. And um, I went to the um, CNO summit one year and I had the badges and they gave me five minutes to speak. I was supposed to speak about something completely different. <laughs> I said, oh, um, I've got these badges to sell for Mary Seacole's statue. They usually cost one pound, but today we're selling them for two pounds. And the reason why I'm selling them for two pounds is because I'm going to sing you a little song so that you will buy one badge. So imagine this, this is the Chief Nurse and Officers Summit with like 200 or I think it was about 500 or 600 directors of nurses and chief nurses and I sang this song I just said a little line I said it takes two baby and then I said it only costs two pounds for the badge I've only got a few when they're gone they're gone and afterwards everybody came along and bought the badges and from that we were able in 2016 the statues that statues are up of Mary Seacole and why I love that picture of Mary Seacole is when I showed that picture so original portrait of Mary Seacole that was found at Winchester College I think in 2014 or 15, somewhere around there, quite recently. 
no, a bit before that. When I showed a picture to my mum, she reckons it looks like her great grandmother. So I would say that there's a possibility that Mary Seacole might be my relative. She comes from Jamaica. There's a possibility. Can you see the resemblance? <laughs> anyway, yeah. <laughs> And then um, the Queen's Nurses Institute, I got this Outstanding Service Award in 2012 from the Queen's Nurses Institute. I've never, I always thought that I was a Queen's nurse because I was a district nurse and it was on my district nursing badge, but I was told that I wasn't, but that I had to apply. But before that, I got this Outstanding Service Award. And as a result, they put my name forward to have my garden done because they, they, they were their charity, um, the National Garden Scheme actually funds the work that they do. I was nominated to have my garden done by Alan Titchmarts. So you can see him there. Alan Titchmarts did my garden. I've got this absolutely phenomenal garden. Can you imagine as a nurse? Got my garden done and it looks absolutely beautiful. Even up to this day, it looks really beautiful. And he put a page up on his website about Mary Seacole to raise funds for Mary Seacole as well. And what was amazing, they even sent a team, or I don't know how they did it, but they did a recording of my charity in Kenya. And they showed it and it was absolutely brilliant. Anyway, if you work in the community for a minimum of five years and you've done some innovative, all these QI projects and stuff that you're doing, you can apply to be a Queen's nurse. And in um, when I became a nurse consultant, the work that had to be a nurse, to be a nurse consultant, you have to have your master's. I know I could talk forever, so I hope I haven't gone too much over time. I've got a little bit more time left, Gemma. OK, I've, um, I did my master's. Actually, when I applied for the nurse consultant role, I fulfilled 90, 99% of the person's spec. The only thing I didn't have was my master's. And I told my, really important, have a mentor or a coach that will support you through everything you're doing, the decisions. I told my mentor that I did, I was, there's no point applying because I haven't got my master's. She said, don't tell them what you haven't got, demonstrate your transferable skills. So on my application form, I said that I was working towards my master's. I didn't tell them I didn't have it. I just said I was working towards it. What that meant is that I'm working towards it. When you pay me to do it, then I'll do it. Well, they thought I was like in it halfway through it or near the end of it. And at my interview, I actually asked them, would you support me in doing my master's? What I meant is, would you pay for me to do my master's? What they thought I meant is that I was doing my master's and would I continue to support them, to support me to do it? And they said, of course, whoever the, the, the um, applicant is, the successful applicant, we will support them to do their master's. I came out of the interview. I thought I interviewed really, really well. I came out of the interview and I saw my mentor, that guy that had been training me, supporting me, developing me through the community children and nursing. He actually actually set up the whole training program for community children's nursing, um, LSBU. And he was there coming for the interview for the job and he had his master's and he was getting ready to do his PhD. And I hadn't even done my master's. I looked at him, I said, what are you doing here? And he goes, good luck in your interview, Joan. And I said, if I'd known that you were applying, I would never have applied for this job. That's another thing. Just because somebody else is applying for something that you want, it doesn't matter how brilliant they are. It doesn't matter how many qualifications they are. If you're the best person for the job, you're the best person for the job. However, I was very upset because he was my mentor. I learned everything from him. And I was convinced that he was going to get this job. Although I felt that I interviewed well, so I went home, they said that you're, they're going to phone me at by midday the next day. Well, by one, coming up to one o'clock, they hadn't phoned me. You can imagine when you're waiting for results. And by then I was beating myself, why did I apply for this job? God, why did you let me apply for this job? And you know he's going to get it and I'm not going to get it. And I was all like this. They phoned me up and they offered me the job. And I said, so why didn't you give it to this guy? And they goes... He, he told, he said, how do you know that he applied? I said, I saw him. They said, he's asked that nobody knows that he applied because he's so upset. He really, really wanted it. But we want to offer it to you. I go, but why do you want to offer it to me? I'm there interrogating them. Why do you want to offer it to me? Why didn't you give it to him? They said, if we needed somebody for the whole of London, we would have given him the job. But we just need somebody just to work in Islington and we could see you working in our team. And the person said, Joan, it will make my day if you take this job. I said, make your day. It will make my day, my week, my month, my year, my life if I get this job. And so that was my next consultant role. I was so happy. Then I told them that I didn't have my master's, but they, they did. They supported me to do my master's. And then they wanted me to do my PhD. I said, I'm not doing no PhD. I don't need a PhD to be a nurse. I don't need a PhD to be in this role. I'm not doing the research where I'm doing the academic route. I'm working as a nurse. I'm a nurse. I don't want to do my PhD. And they were trying to force me to do it. 
And in the end, because it, they, they had this meeting where it was the chief nurse, the director, everybody, we will support you, we will help. I said, I don't want to do it. I don't want to, I want to do, I don't mind doing studying up something else, but I don't want to do it. And in the end, I goes, okay, I'll do my PhD. And they were all smiling. I goes, yeah, I want to do it in biblical studies. And then they changed their mind. And after that, they never asked me again. <laughs> I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having a PhD, but I didn't want to do a taught PhD. But what was really great, that Middlesex University, who I used to teach, I was a lecturer practitioner in um, LSBU, Middlesex, and Hertfordshire. And Middlesex, I used to do a lot of teaching for them for free. And they never paid me. I said, how come everybody else pays me when I do um, lecturing there? And they told me that I never asked them. That's why they never paid me. And when I asked them, they said, it's too late. You can't ask me now. But that was like from 2004. But in 2015, they gave me an honorary doctorate. So I didn't need to do my PhD. So that was fantastic. So I'm really proud of that. And that's just to say, really important to public, to write, to write articles, publish, go to conferences, make sure that people know what you're doing and, and share your experience and knowledge and learning. Those quality improvement projects that you guys have done, you can write them up and put them in, the, in the, um, any of those nursing journals for other people to learn from them as well. Really, really important. One of the best articles I wrote was 2015. I wrote the challenges of identifying eczema in darkly pigmented skin. It took me 10 years for them to accept that. I wrote it first in 2015. Five, November 2005, I was told that I didn't have enough research evidence for it. I didn't know. First of all, they told me I didn't have enough materials, so I wrote more. They said no. Then they told me I didn't have enough research. And then when I got my job as a, a senior lecturer at South Bank University, I did this big research stuff on all everything to do with um, dark skin, and I was able to write it, and it was published in 2015. So that's my proudest article that I've ever written. And in 2018, I was asked to write a chapter for a book on dermatological conditions in children. And when I set up my eczema clinic, even though I, it was set up in 2006, it's still running now. So the legacy still re runs on. I had a nurse that I trained up to work in the team and I asked if she could do could co-author it with me because she was still working in the team and now I'd working in the university. So we wrote that chapter together. So I'm really proud of that as well. Uh, let me nearly finish. Oops. Um, just some of the awards that I've got. My proudest one, oops, something's happened there. Let's go back one. Proudest one is my Zenith Global Health Award because I've, I've, I've done medical missions in Uganda, Ghana, and Kenya. And I've actually got a charity in Kenya, so I'm there most years. It's the first time I haven't been out of the country for two years. Can't wait to go back. But that's just some of the awards that I've got. And of course, my Florence Nightingale Leadership Scholarship. Absolutely fantastic. I just feel so proud being a part of the Florence Nightingale Foundation. They're doing absolutely phenomenal work. And over the years, increasingly over the years, they've branched it out so it actually encapsulates more and more people. Because originally, I always thought the Florence Nightingale Foundation was just for chief nurses and directors. But the fact that they've opened it up so that from band, I believe you have from band fives as well, don't you? Band fives, all the bands going up. So nobody is excluded because all of us are phenomenal and brilliant. Doesn't matter what band you are. We shouldn't even be described by our bands. Let me go to the next slide. I'm nearly finished. And that's just to show you the scholarship of, um, oops. Um, I didn't do the Mary Seacole Scholarship Award. I was actually, at the Department of Health actually did a review of the Mary Seacole's awards. And what's really great, the awards are now part of the um, Florence Nightingale. I believe they're part of what the work of Florence Nightingale as well. So there's no rivalry. They're just as brilliant as each other in different ways. You just have to acknowledge that. And this is my last slide. Oh, I think it's my last slide. Everyone should be enthusiastic, passionate, and fervent about what you do. And I've seen that in all the different projects that you've just been talk talking about. Excel in your area of experience and expertise. Have a personal development plan, a three year, five year, six months, two months, whatever. Have a plan of where you want to go and what you want to do. And then the five P's, proper preparation prevents poor performance. Um, always see obstructions, obstacles and oppositions, which you'd always get along the way as opportunities and then ask yourself what opportunity do you have to optimistically overcome your obstacles see the windows of opportunities and go through the open doors be self-aware emotional intelligence is really important be self-aware self-different discipline and self-manage if you can manage yourself then you'll be able to manage everything else around you
um, utilize what you've got where you are until you get where you need to go. Often we think the grass is greener on the other side. It's only green over there because you can't see all the weeds that are over there and somebody else is watering it for you. When you get over there and look back to where you came from, you're going to think, why did I think it was so bad? I remember a member of staff told me that I was the worst manager she ever had. Two years after she left, she wrote me a letter apologising. I didn't realise how good you were because sometimes they've got nothing to compare it with. They're not with us, with our parents. We think our parents are the worst parents because we see our friends' parents. And when you were little, everybody's parent was better than your parent. Everybody else's house was better than your house. And even their food was better than your food. And it's not until you get over that side and you're stuck over there that you suddenly realise and you look back, you suddenly realise it wasn't that bad after all. So wherever you are now, wherever you're working, you're with those people that you can learn from them, pick up new skills and stuff from them, so that when you get to your future role, you'll be better. And as I keep mentioning about having a role model, have a mentor, have a coach, go and um, shadow people, spend time with different people doing the role that you want to do so that you can learn from them and even get job descriptions of the roles. That, I've got a nurse consultant job description so that I could see the person's back to see where all the gaps were so I could develop from that. So I need to develop here, I need to develop there. Rather than thinking that you're brilliant and excellent and superb, which you are, but you still need to develop your skills and competencies to get to those levels. And last but not least, exposure. You need to let your light shine. Many of us are hiding our, our, our light under a little bush somewhere, under the table, and nobody tells nobody about what you do. I'm on the Nursing Times and Nursing Standard award panels, and very few people like to share how brilliant they are. It's often other people pushing them. One, I went, I was at, I was at the Nursing Times um, award panel on um, Monday, and one of the girls there that was there, it was her manager that put, put it all, the form in all for her, and then forced her to come along to, to, to present her, her thing. And she was absolutely brilliant, but she didn't think she was brilliant. And often we don't think that we're that good because we're always comparing ourselves to other people. But the best way to think that you're good is to compare yourself to yourself. And then you can see how you were last year compared to how you are this year. Whereas if I compare myself with Gemma, I would think, oh, Gemma's absolutely brilliant. She's done all this research work. And she says, oh, and then, oh, I'm so awful and useless and worthless. No, no, no. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Compare yourself to yourself. And obviously it was a great honour to receive the OBE from Prince William. It was the first time that he gave out the award. You can see me holding his hand there. I wouldn't let go of his hand. He looks so lovely. And he was talking to me like he knew everything about me. They have a little person behind. When they announce your name, the person behind them is saying, now Joan is this and this and this and this. So by the time I get there, He's talking to me like he knows all about me. And it was just, it was absolutely brilliant doing that. And but the thing is getting it OB, I've got a big head already. I know I'm, I'm brilliant. I've got a big head, but my head was swelling. I mean, it was big. People kept telling me how brilliant I am, how excellent I am. And so uh, my head got so big, I thought I had to leave the country. So I went to Kenya, I've got a charity in Kenya, and I spent time in the slum area with all the children there. And they kept going, auntie, what does OBE mean? I said, oh, OBE, it just means overflowing blessings every day. So that's what I always call it, overflowing blessings every day. All of us have got an OBE. We've got overflowing blessings every day. And my last slide, my greatest legacy is in 2002, I went to Kenya for the first time. I fell in love with this little girl here. Her name's Sharon. She was like three and a half years old. She actually looks like she could be my daughter. And she's just beautiful. And I just fell in love with her. And I felt like God was saying, everybody knows Jesus loves them. God loves them. You love them. Demonstrate my love in action. And God John, said that. Yeah? John, are you trying to present to us? We can't see anything. It's only the first slide leaving a legacy in nothing. Oh, wow. Can't you see any of the slides? Um, we have it, no. Oh, Gemma. Don't, worry, don't worry, Joan, we'll, we'll share your slides to follow. Don't worry, that's fine. We'll make sure you, you can get see that. You can't see any of the slides at all? We can see your title slide with all your badges. But don't oh, worry, wow. don't worry, it's been fine. It's but we followed your story brilliantly. So we'll share oh, the slides, don't I'm worry. I'm so sorry, I've got, I've got the slide here. I can see it, but you lot can't see it. I'm so sorry. It's not moved along, but don't honestly, don't worry. We'll share it. We'll share it with everybody. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. But my last slide's got my little little girl that I sponsored for when she was three and a half years old, and she's now um, 22. When she was 18, she told me that I was her role model and she wanted to be a nurse. So I've got a picture of her there with her nurse's uniform. So that's my greatest legacy. So thank you. I'm so sorry that you couldn't see all those slides. But I finished. I hope I finished on time. Perfect timing, Joan, literally to the minute. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. I knew it would be a complete 
whirlwind of inspiration and you absolutely didn't didn't disappoint there's loads of questions for you in the chat box Joan so if you wouldn't mind staying online and just responding people are really interested in your charity work particularly so okay. that would be wonderful and oh, it's so disappointing you didn't see the slides with all the pictures and the badges and everything we shall share them we, we will absolutely share them okay I'll send them to you thank, thank you. you thank you so much so guys, you've had a long time to listen today and hopefully very stimulated and inspired by the messages you heard there from Joan and the other presenters today. So we want to give you some time to reflect together on your, on your learning so far on the programme and really to uh, make a, a mark in the sand of where you think you are at just now, where you think your leadership journey has taken you to this point and, and what your aspirations are for your future. So we're going to break you out into some small groups and you'll work together until around half past 12 when we'll bring you back together uh, again to share those reflections. If we could ask you to nominate somebody from each of your group to share with us either one word or one line that really captures your Florence Nightingale Foundation Windrush Leadership Programme journey. So just a, just a real summary in a line or a word that captures that. So you will be broken into, I think, probably about six or seven groups. So just make a note of which group number you go into. Uh, there'll be people in your group from the other cohorts. So you'll get a chance to network with the wider Windrush alumni community. And we shall see you back here at around about half past 12. So we've got about 25 minutes for you to spend some time reflecting and sharing with each other. And just one final great big thank you to Joan and to Liz, who I think will be leaving us now at this point as well. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with us our celebrations. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. I'll just put my um, Twitter handle in the chat so you can follow me on Twitter. Oh, I'd recommend that definitely. If you need a smile in your day, then you need to follow Joan. <laughs> and I'll send my slides in so you can share them with everyone, um, Gemma. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Joan. Okay. And um, I'll, I'll pass you over to Jackie now, who's going to pop you into your breakout rooms. OK, it looks like everybody is back, which is brilliant. So we've not hopefully lost too many people in the... Uh, teleportation that is Zoom breakout rooms. So hopefully we're all here and um, welcome back. I hope that you um, felt like that time just to connect with the wider group and share some thoughts and reflections was, was valuable to you just to pause and think at this moment and really recognise where we're at in terms of that journey. So I'd like to invite a, a, a reflection from each group. And as I said before, to, to keep that succinct to a word or a phrase that really captures your experiences of your, your programme. Uh, so I'll start off with group one, if that's OK. So do we have a person, a spokesperson for group one? Yeah, my group is group one. Um... We had a lot of discussion about where we started, where we have the, all the journey we've gone through and where we are right now, which uh, and a, a little bit of our um, uh, projects, we discuss a little bit about that. And in, within us, we find that we all have grown into, a, into a, um, uh, confident in what we do, and we've acquired a lot of knowledge along the line, sharing ideas with our peers, even with our colleagues at work, other uh, MDTs, because we have to work with them. And uh, we've widened our knowledge in a different areas um, relating to other departments and uh, whatnot. So um, uh, some of the co my colleagues in the team, they have actually some are managers in their ward, which they have to manage a lot of people and have to um, um, sort out what's happening in the ward, both patient care and uh, other stuff. And some in band six and um, um, have to do a lot of uh, research in what they in their departments and in, in order to improve patient care, which has been a lot of progress and uh, some hasn't been <clears throat> completed. <clears throat> as that yet. Uh, and for my own pro uh, project, which was a big success, uh, we had we made a completion before um, 
we finished uh, this uh, program. Um, they were all impressed because obviously they, it was like some sort of mist in the system because I did the body mass index. Um, so which uh, when it was brought out, they were like, oh, that has been, um, a, been a bit of neglect in the system because it wasn't picked up at a time. So in all, we enjoyed this um, leadership program because it has given us a wide knowledge of, um, um, <laughs> given us a, a wide knowledge of, in order to um, in, um, acquire a lot knowledge of what we didn't know about before and improve our confidence and improve the bits that we've known and uh, find out where we are, oh, how we started, what the journey we've walked through, where we are heading to, and we actually um, know where our stand at the moment because we've uh, acquired a lot of skills, knowledge, and uh, interact with people, okay. get to improve our, our, our skills in what we want to do, and actually we know where we are going next. So we Brilliant. want to enjoy the program. Thank you, Emanuela. That's, um, that's wonderful feedback. And certainly um, that message around confidence. I know when we spoke about those early goals, it was uh, a common ground across all of the groups that the development of confidence was a real goal and hope for the programme. So I'm so pleased that that's something that you feel you've taken from that. So you yeah. did an excellent job there at summarising. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And our next group, Group 2, do we have a spokesperson for Group 2? Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, say. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, so our group started off with our conversation, um, when we started our conversation this morning about transformation. I think all of us have been through great transformation that enabled us to build our confidence, be courageous, and need us to be, to know that we're very resilient in what we do. I think the title of the court's, itself which is Windrush leadership resonates to every single one of us and that enabled us to know what the transformation was and in the end leaded us to have the confidence and the courage and the skills that we learned to move forward and always maintain our resilience of where we want to go so that is our group thank you thank you Suad that's wonderful and you know interestingly we've been doing some work around rebranding FNF and the the word transformation is the is the is the central part of that new rebrand because you're brilliant you're wonderful when you come but not necessarily showing that to the rest of the world and um and also not necessarily being recognized for your brilliance beforehand so that's the transformation isn't it and it's wonderful thank you Suad. Right, okay, so our next group, group three, our spokesperson for group three. I Thank will volunteer. You, <laughs> That's fine. Um, there was quite a lot of discussion similar to what has already been um, presented by the other groups. But some of the words that were mentioned on how people felt and their journey so far was how this course has been quite an, you know, someone used the word inspirational to describe their experience a life-changing experience and some people felt very much strengthened the and really grown like in terms of emotional intelligence knowing themselves um and people just knowing that they they have the impact they can make a change that is a massive thing really self-belief that you can go you can do it and for me the words that always stands out for me was advice somebody gave on that uh, do not wait to be offered a chair on the table grab a chair and ask people which way they're going to move to allow you to sit on it but you have to go for it so yeah, yeah thank you wonderful Barry that that is yeah I love that I absolutely love that I'm really um reflects Joan's story I myself and Jackie were just talking that you know don't take no for an answer just persistently tell people what you can offer them and believe in your abilities and your strengths and eventually you will get there you will get there fantastic thank you so much wonderful work from group three so group four our next group hi everyone my name is Angela and I'll be speaking for our group four uh yeah so in our team, we discussed about the power of networking and teamwork if you need your objectives to be met. Uh, from uh, this program, we uh, learned that we've been so lucky to uh, gain um, 
so many qualities of leadership that uh, most of us have uh, had difficulties during our projects, uh, including redeployment. And uh, during the process, some of us were actually trusted to be taken to other wards that were not performing well to make change happen, although they may be struggling, but we feel like uh, that is like you, you've been given so much trust to do this. So uh, we came up with one word uh, to describe the whole process and we chose uplifting. Oh, fabulous. Thank you, Angela. That was beautifully articulated. I think you've done group four proud there. I really love that. I really love that it is for me about elevation. It's about it's about bringing your strength to the surface and, and enabling that strength to really influence and, and allowing others to see that as well. And it sounds like you've been recognized for that in the work that you've been do, you've been doing locally, which is fabulous. Thank you so much. And this is just about continuing on, along that path now and using those new platforms. Fantastic. Thank you, Angela. Uplifting. I'm writing it down. And group five. And most of the stuff that we discussed has already been mentioned by the other groups in a way. But what comes up for all of us is that no one, no, no one is living the same way we started. Mm -hmm. We've all gained confidence and we've come to a conclusion that this program is one of the um, amazing and inspiring courses that we've attended. Um, at the moment, most of us are using the leadership skills that we learned from this end, and our colleagues could see differences in us at the moment. Um, we are also taking part in, de in decision-making at the workplace, because at first they just throw decisions made at management level to us. Nowadays, we are consulted before um, decisions are implemented. Another positive aspect is um, it has given us a focus as to where we need to be in the next future. I mean, the next year or two, people have other plans to apply for um, positions of higher band or pursue different courses. And it is all due to the inspirational speeches from the um, those who came to speak to us and uh, the only disappointment that we shared is the fact that this pandemic could not make us meet face to face. And the second bit is we were thinking of a bit of um, like certification or accreditation to indicate that we've attended this um, inspiring and amazing course. Yes. So that Thank is you. what we Thank got. You, right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Again, really resonates with that transition theme. And just to pick up on those couple of points that you made, we we will, uh, we hope, be able to do the Westminster Abbey celebration service, uh, commemoration service in May, where all of our leadership programme participants and scholars will be invited. So there'll be that opportunity to come together and celebrate at that point. Um, and, and also just a comment that that our feedback has been that there are many, many people on the programme that wouldn't have been able to engage had it been face to face. So we're, we're committed to a more blended approach moving forward so that we don't exclude those of us that have got caring responsibilities uh, or personal circumstances, which mean travelling to face-to-face um, -face locations would mean we wouldn't have been able to access the programme. So going forward, it'll be a bit of both. So thank, but thank you for that feedback, Rodney. That's wonderful. And group six. Yeah, hi, that's me. Hi, group six. So um, Pauline said that it, the course, the program enabled her to realize her true potential and it helped to give her voice to challenge decisions about patient care and also what was right for herself as well. Um, um, then Esther, um, it said that the programme gave her the opportunity, opportunity, learning opportunities for skills and empowered her to apply her learning in the workplace. But it also helped her to understand where, where things are systemic and you can't make those changes. It's OK to move on. Um, yes. And also Janetta said it boosted her confidence in public speaking and she's done a lovely presentation today and also meeting, speaking to new people. 
and also leading with a common vision, which is very hard. You know, when you start this project, any project, you have to inspire the team by leading that vision. And then we had Millie. Um, she said that the program gave her permission to lift her head up and um, know that she can bring her ideas um, of change um, to the table and felt free to be able to sit at that table as well. Um, and for myself, it, the programme was a bit of a journey of self-discovery because I didn't see myself as a leader. And when you join the group, everybody seems incredible. They've got all these skills. So for me, it gave myself permission to be authentic and permission to shine. But also for me, it was being in, in, um, enabled me to inspire and empower other people because we can't forward change with our upskilling our teams. Um, and so, you know, it was, for me, it was about inspiring others and making those change with people power, basically. Mm -hmm. So for our team, it's just upwards and upwards and upwards, that's it. <laughs> Wonderful. Wow, Stephanie, gosh, group six, amazing. I I feel like if I if I had a hopes and dreams and goals for a leadership program myself that you guys would would gain from this, you've listed every single one of those there. It's just phenomenal the impact individually, personally, it's had on people and then the ripple effects that that's had amongst your teams and the people who receive your health and care services as well so thank you so much for that Stephanie that's wonderful and I just noticed in the um, chat I didn't um, I didn't respond to Rodney's comment about a certificate you will receive a certificate um, once you complete your evaluation your certificate is sent to you automatically and you'll also be sent a lovely Florence badge so you will have seen um, you will have seen that, that Joan had that Florence badge so that will be on its way to you as well so we're, so that's there for you. Thank you, Stephanie and, and Rodney. And our final group, group seven. So um, basically from our discussion, we were just basically discussion, what, discussing what the course did for us. Um, and it was about the inspiration we got on the leadership program from the speakers. Also the um, discussions formulated within our groups, within our WhatsApp groups, making friendships and networking. Um, and we also had a bit of a discussion about where we would like to be. And um, I think from, if I'm wrong, my teammates can, my group mates can say, but it's about us developing and going on and into more, uh, maybe a higher leadership uh, roles, uh, maybe applying for different jobs that they can take them on a more career journey um, and to support that. So that's kind of like what we discussed about where we wanna be. Um, after the course. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Valerie. And we would love to be able to stay in touch with you all as well to, to hear about whether you have been able to put these things into practice and take some of those ambitions, particularly for, for new uh, career pathways or promotion, um, how you've been able to take those things forward. That would be absolutely wonderful for us to, to hear ultimately when we um when we break this down to its rawest form we know that Liz Fenton and, and others um who are funding these programs will want to see the difference that it's making in terms of that race equality data and they'll want to see that these programs have encouraged and enabled that career progression to happen now that's not an individual's responsibility it's a whole system's responsibility but knowing now that you have got the confidence to put yourself forward for roles that perhaps you may not have considered previously is one part of that so thank you for that feedback Valerie that's wonderful so our reflections from our group is fantastic we wanted to because we're such a big group today and we're not face to face we would normally now be handing out our certificates but uh, instead of that, what we've done is a roll of honour. So if I'll ask Jackie just to move us our slides along for each of our cohorts, everybody's name is on the next three slides. So if we just take a moment, everyone pop, pop your sound on for a minute. Let's take ourselves off mute and give, first of all, cohort one a massive round of applause. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Last but not 
not least, cohort three. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> now I really want to be in a room with you all so we can have a glass of champagne. That's what we should be doing, shouldn't we? Well, no, real congratulations, everybody. And, and as you've heard already today, it's just the start of the journey with FNF. So I'm going to introduce you now to Adam, who you met earlier, who's going to tell you a bit more about the alumni community and um, how we'll continue to support you. What do you do? Thank you, Gemma. Yes, um, I do. So firstly, thank to, thanks to all of you, all of today's presenters and guest speakers, and congratulations on completing your leadership course and becoming an FNF alumni. You are now part of an ever-growing community made up of about 1,500 alumni. So what are your benefits? Well, I've just sent you an email uh, to confirm that you're already set up on our system and you'll be receiving regular updates, which include uh, monthly newsletters that provides you with all the latest news, events, and access to our free regular webinars that we provide. Now, events include opportunities to attend our special Westminster Abbey service to commemorate Florence Nightingale's birthday on the 11th of May next year. But those who are observant amongst you know that it's actually a day earlier than her actual birthday this year. You'll also have access to our free online webinars, which I just mentioned, which are provided by booking tickets via our Eventbrite system. We run about two a month and they're hosted by a variety of highly regarded guest speakers that we have and cover many relevant areas, such as writing for uh, professional publication, how to lead change in social care, etc. We also run audience with sessions, which are very interactive with opportunities for Q and A's. And recently we had um, Duncan Burton, the Director okay. Chief Nurse of NHS England, talking about policy development. Upcoming events include, should nurses be free to be change agents and innovation leaders? And social media, professional influencing tool by our very own intern, Jess Sainsbury. Most exciting and very relevant is in October, we have Dr. April Brown, the Improvement Director at NHS Improvement, who will be talking about and to our alumni who have been through the Windrush programme. So I do employ you to feel onto that. We also have what we call our Star Alumni Series, which are individual case studies that recognises the journey you have made throughout your career and how this programme has impacted you. Please reach out to me if you'd like to share your story and importantly to inspire others. Once completed, this will go on our website and in our newsletters so we can reach out to you and ask further to contribute to our story in social media and for any press requests. We also have, talking which media engagement events to provide informed opinion and knowledge exchange. We're also seeking volunteers who would like to donate some time to mentor our FNF Academy members and all their nurses and midwives. If you're interested, please contact me as well. We also have the FNF Advisory Board made up of our members, which identifies and prioritizes key policy issues and has the shared governance forum contributing directly to them on policy consultation. And as an alumni, you can also personally have direct influence, calls to action, and NHS England do reach out for opportunities for you to contribute. Finally, you're going to be part of the online community and we're working on our portal, which should be ready at uh, the end of the year, where you'll be able to share your knowledge and expertise with us. Hope that's been useful and I look forward to speaking to you soon. Back to Gemma. Thank you, Adam. So the key message to take there is loads and loads of opportunities to use the platform that the Florence Nightingale Foundation creates for you to have even further extended influence than you have previously even imagined in yourself. So when those newsletters come out or those invitations, those call to actions come to you, please, please don't think, oh, that's for someone else. So they're talking to Patricia or Esther will respond to that one. This is absolutely your opportunity to be involved and put everything into practice. And, you know, you've met some of our scholars already on the programme. They have really utilised this network and it, is, it has enhanced their career opportunities from strength to strength. So let that be you. Let that be you as well. OK, so our final task of the day is to encourage you to evaluate our programme. So we're going to uh, leave this link up and again, we'll pop it in the chat box that you can follow. Once you've completed this evaluation, you will automatically receive a certificate. And the oh, sorry, Patricia. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Don't worry, don't worry. Yeah. 
Yeah, my daughter was it's all right, I'll just <laughs> <laughs> so I think Patricia's uh, somebody got a visitor there, that's fine. But anyway, your evaluation will uh, enable you to achieve your get your certificate. So please do complete that for us. It's really as as well as those. Uh, statistics that help us demonstrate the impact of the program. This helps us to demonstrate your satisfaction with the program and also to help us improve for future cohorts. So we're really, really hopeful that we'll continue to run the Windrush programs moving forward. Keep an eye out for when the adverts are there and reach out to people in your organisation that you think would also benefit from this opportunity. Uh, right at the beginning of the programme, uh, Liz gave a call to action and she said that we need, to, we need to create a critical mass and we need to share this learning as widely as possible and bring others along with us. So that's, uh, that's my ask of you really, is to support and mentor others to put in the best possible applications so that we can really grow the Windrush alumni from strength to strength. Hello, can I say something? Um, I'm not able to scan because I'm using my phone. If it could be um, this uh, questionnaire could be sent to us via email. I'm not able to scan because I'm using right. my phone and I'm outside. Community. Yeah, when we send the presentations, I'll put it in the body of the email so you'll have the links as well. Yep. Please, yeah. because okay. like, right, I'm using you. my phone as well. Thank you. Yeah, no thank problem you. at all. No problem at all. Enjoy the rest of your days all and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.